Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, and I'd first like to start off by saying um, how educational, really, it's been looking up this simple phrase. Um, and in the context of other Bible sayings, um, there's a real wealth, I think, of just on a literary level, there's a real wealth to our Bible in front of us. Um, I had a quick look at some other, I've not looked at the rest of the program that you've got coming up, but um, certain Bible sayings such as to bite the dust, can a leopard change his spots, to go the extra mile, or the writings on the wall, um, and there are many, many others which have come into our English language, haven't they, today, that we understand, and they've got a real resonance. And I think on one level we shouldn't underestimate or we, sh we should value um, the fact that this book, uh, even on a literary level, has a wealth of lovely sayings and phrases. And of course it's much deeper than that. Um, but I think we should appreciate that, um, that it is a, a work of literary genius. Um, so, we're looking to, this afternoon at Pride Goes Before a Fall, and this is the approach I'd like to take. We want to have a look at where, where do we find this phrase in the Bible? Um, does anyone know off the top of their head which um, book of the Bible, apart from the person who put the plan together? <laughs> Any ideas? Proverbs. Proverbs, right. Good. So we're all going to learn something, apart from Dave, who's, who knows it already. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Uh, we want to look at where it is, and more importantly, the context of where it's found, because that's going to hopefully help us um, explain what it's getting at. And then we're going to have a look at two examples of this phrase in action in the lives of two men in the Bible. Maybe you could be thinking about who those two men might be. You might uh, have someone in mind for that. Then we'll think about the teaching of Jesus, and then most importantly, why is this relevant? Why are we actually talking about this phrase at all? Um, and it is relevant for you and for me. Now, we're only going to look at four or five Bible passages, so if you can turn them up with me, that will be helpful. So then, first of all, where is this phrase found? Well done, Dave. Proverbs chapter 16. So if you could come there, please, first of all. And really, it's not a, it's not a direct quote. It's almost a combination of one verse put together here. Proverbs, after Psalms, we've got Proverbs... Chapter 16, and we'll think about who wrote these as well in a minute. And we want to have a look at verse 18, where it says, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty or a high spirit before a fall. So that's really where this phrase is taken, Proverbs 16, verse 18. And it's, as I say, it's a combination really of those two proverbs. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And it's a combination of those two. And really, they're saying the same thing, aren't they? So who wrote this proverb? And maybe why did he write it? Well, just um, keep a finger in Proverbs 16 and come back to the first chapter of Proverbs. And we'll get the answer here in verse 1. So Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 1, where it says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. So this is a... Proverb, uh, a book of proverbs of wise sayings written by the son of David, King Solomon. And the reason in verse 2, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to re receive instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. So, to answer our question, Solomon is the author of this proverb, Pride Goes Before a Fall. And the reason he wrote these proverbs were to give us, the reader, instruction and wisdom to give us understanding. Um, so that's the reason behind it. So let's have a look at the context now of this proverb. If we come back, please. I want to come back to Proverbs 50 because there's a, a selection of verses here we'll go through quite quickly just to give us the context of this phrase. So if we look in chapter 15 of Proverbs and verse 25, it says, The Lord will destroy the house of the proud 
but he will establish the border of the widow. So that's quite a strong uh, phrase, isn't it? That he will dis- God will destroy the house of the proud. So that tells us something about God's um, view of human beings who are proud. He's going to destroy their house. But he will establish the border of the widow. And what it's talking about there really is the widow who um, has lost her husband, um, is a vulnerable, presumably humble character, and God is going to look after and establish and, and champion the cause of those who are needy and those who are, um, those who are humble. And we'll see that later on. But if we keep on looking uh, in verse 33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. And obviously humility being the opposite of, of pride. This is the, this is the context of, of this, um, this proverb. Over in chapter 16 and verse 5, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. And again, that's quite a strong language, isn't it? If we are proud, that's an abomination to God. God doesn't like the proud. So we're getting a bit of a a theme here, aren't we? A consistent message about God's view on proud people. And then finally, verse 19. Better is it to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. So it's better to have a a discreet, low, um, humble life with those people who are humble than to enjoy great riches with the proud. That's what um, it's saying. So God clearly doesn't want us to be proud in our lives. He wants us, he's looking for humility. So that's the context of where it's found. And uh, we can all remember that now, can't we? Proverbs 16, verse 18. Right, let's see this in action now. And we're going to look at two examples of this proverb, this saying in action. The first character I'd like us to think about is Nebuchadnezzar. I don't know if that was one of the men you were thinking of. Um, who was brought low. Let's come over, please, to the prophecy of Daniel and chapter 3. So we've got the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then Daniel. And there are many other examples we could look at in the scriptures of characters of, of men and women who were proud and who <coughs> had, had to be humbled and had a fall. But we're going to look at just two. So we want to look at Nebuchadnezzar and the for the context here, we're talking about 600 years before Christ was born in Babylon, which today is modern-day Iraq. Um, and we're in chapter 3. And really, this follows on from chapter 2, which um, is where Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. It was a dream of a great, terrible image, uh, which represented many kingdoms of the world through history. And in chapter 3, we get Nebuchadnezzar building an image which really represented him. And let's just read about this in verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score, or sixty, cubits. The bread thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. So it was about 90 foot tall, I think, this image, this statue of gold, which was quite a size. You would see it from a long way off, and it represented Nebuchadnezzar. And As we're going to see now in this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar was a tyrant. He was a dictator. He wanted to oppress and manipulate his people. This wasn't a democracy as we like to think we live in now. This was a very powerful king. And what we're going to read about now is how he manipulated, how he oppressed the people in his kingdom. So verse 2, Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather all, all people in society of captains, princes, governors, judges, treasurers, counsellors, the sheriffs, the rulers of the provinces, they came to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, um, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counsellors, they gathered together to this dedication. Verse 4, Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations and languages, at what time you hear the sound of a variety of musical instruments here, cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image which Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoso falleth not down and worships shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning 
fiery furnace. So we can see what's happening here, can't we? Nebuchadnezzar is wanting to impress on his people how important he is. He's got this image made to represent him. And whenever the music comes over, I mean, it almost reminds me really of when the um, loudspeakers come up in the Middle East come out and they call people to prayer. This is a similar thing, isn't it? This is a, whenever you hear this music, all people have to bow down to this image. Now, it so happens that there were some people in Babylon at the time who realized that they shouldn't be bowing down to an idol or to a human king and they were Jewish and we see these are Daniel's friends of course Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and we read in verse 12 there are certain Jews who you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego these men O king have not regarded you they don't serve your gods nor worship the golden image which you have set up. So here's a resistance to this dictatorship and to this oppression. Um, and we might think, well, for a proud man like Nebuchadnezzar, what would his reaction be? Would it be, well, oh, I understand, you know, I understand you have a different religion. You're not prepared to worship my gods. I'll, I can tolerate that. Well, no, let's have a look. Verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and in his fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he asked them in verse 14, Is this true, that you don't serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? And then Nebuchadnezzar gives them a, another chance, verse 15. If you be ready this time, when you hear the music, and you fall down, you prostrate yourselves and worship the image which I have made, well, but if you worship not, you will be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God who will deliver you out of my hands? So we learn a lot about Nebuchadnezzar here, don't we? This is all about him. It's about, and really all of the examples we'll look at, it's about man's pride versus the power and almightiness of God. That's really what it's all about. It's about humanism. When we think about our, our pride in ourselves, it's about us putting ourselves higher than God has said we should. So, he says, who is that God who will deliver you out of my hands? There's a challenge here, isn't there? Is your God going to deliver you out of my hands? This is all very personal pride, isn't it, of um, Nebuchadnezzar. And what these three men say now is quite amazing. In verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful, we're not worried to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. So what confidence, what trust that they would escape this punishment, um, that God would deliver them. But then look at verse 18. But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods nor worship the golden image which you have set up. So, you know, this is... A red rag to a bull, isn't it? This this is saying we won't. Our God will deliver us, but if He doesn't, we're still not going to obey Your word. So, how did Nebuchadnezzar react? Verse nineteen. He was full of fury, and the form of his visage, his face, was changed against them. And he therefore and spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times more than it was usual to be heated. So, something that goes hand in hand in hand with pride and with human pride is. Anger. And we, we sang about that in our first hymn. Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. Verse 13 says, Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and in his fury. What an insult to his ego, to his dominance and his uh, leadership. How could you, how dare you disobey my commands? Well, if we know the story, these three men, of course, were saved from this burning fiery furnace. Verse 23, these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. He rose up in haste and said to his counsellors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they said, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like to the Son of God. And of course, this is an angel which has come to deliver these three men. So they have a miraculous escape, don't they, these three men? 
Now, how did this affect Nebuchadnezzar? From being this proud despot, this dictator, this brutal leader who was trying to oppress his people, look at what he says in verse um, 28. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god, including my own, except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill. Because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. So it's an amazing turnaround, isn't it, from this man who uh, thought he could tell everybody in his kingdom what to do, to bow down, to worship him and his image and his gods. And he's humbled here, isn't he? He has to realise that there is no other God than the living God of the Bible, the living God of these three men. And we can carry on in the life of Nebuchadnezzar if we come over to chapter 4 now. And we won't go into this in detail, but Nebuchadnezzar had a dream here. It it was basically about a tree, which was about to be chopped down and felled. And it represented him. And he was this strong, powerful leader, this man who was about to be chopped down to size, if you like. Um, And he had to learn here, as verse 17 of chapter 4 says, um, partway through the verse, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High, that's God himself, rules in the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whomsoever he will, and he sets up over it the basest of men. And, you know, this week we might be seeing, you know, something like this, mightn't we? Clinton or Trump, whoever it is, the leaders of this world, they're put in power by God. God sets up over this world the basest of men. And Nebuchadnezzar had to learn this too. just want to pick up verse 30. If we can have a look at Daniel 4 and verse 30. Look at Nebuchadnezzar's um, attitude here. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honour of my majesty? So he's got a... This is what a proud man speaks like. It's all about me. It's all about... I, me, I built it. I built Babylon. The might of my power, the honour of my majesty. Well, God had plans for Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 31, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee and they shall drive you from men. Your dwelling will be with the beasts of the field and you will eat grass like an ox. So Nebuchadnezzar was going to be humbled. He was going to fall this proud um, king, this proud man. And in verse 37, we have the end result. And this is typical of Nebuchadnezzar. He goes from one minute from being up here, and the next minute he's completely humbled. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honour the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. And I suppose in many ways, this is what God's work is. It is to humble those who are proud. And Nebuchadnezzar had to learn that lesson. All right, so that's our first example. And the second one I want to think about is Haman, uh, which immediately came to my mind because this, this man and his story really is made for, for Hollywood. This, this would make such a great film, as we're going to see. Um, some, of the, some of the incidents and timing in this, uh, this man's life are, are amazing. So come back, please, to Esther. Esther in chapter 3. So we've got Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. This time we're in Persia, which is modern-day Iran, and we're about 400 years before Christ. And what I want to just point out here in this man Haman's life is how he was promoted and how which such a high position in life he got to. Um, and it deceived him because he became very proud. So we look in Esther in chapter 3. And the context here in verse 1. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. So 
Esther 3, verse 1. So here's a man who's been promoted, who's been advanced, who's been set above, it says. And what a surprise, when he got into this position of power and of advancement, of being promoted, he took advantage. Look at verse 2. All the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But... And here's, here's a, the pesky Jews coming into play again. But Mordecai, who was a Jew, bowed not, nor did him reverence. And again, this is about the pride of man, about someone thinking they've got a high position, they want to be uh, worshipped and adored. And here's a, a Jew who, who knows. He shouldn't, the only, person, the only uh, being he should be bowing down to and worshipping is God Almighty. So we come to verse 5. When Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath and thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. For they showed him the people of Mordecai and that he was a Jew. So again, we've got this idea of anger and fury, haven't we? And scorn that comes along with, with pride. And if we read the rest of the chapter, which we won't now, from verse 8 to the end of the chapter, it's really about Haman making a decree to kill all the Jews that were in the provinces. And really, this is, this is really what Esther is all about. It's about a genocide of the Jews and how God was going to save them by, through Queen Esther. Now, we just move over to chapter 5, please. And we just want to look at the way that Haman um, deals with this promotion. <coughs> Maybe we could think about the way that we deal with promotion or advancement or in our lives if we have that. Because in verse, chapter 5 and verse 11, Haman told them of the glory of his riches, the multitude of his children, and all the things wherein the king had promoted him, how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. So here's a man who just talks about himself, isn't he? about his glory, about his, his um, possessions, about how he'd been promoted. It was all about himself, this selfish pride. And yet, in verse 13, all this avails me nothing as long as I see Mordecai the Jew, the Jew sorry, sitting at the king's gate. So in other words, I've got all of these riches, all of this promotion, but as long as I see this, as I see this man, Mordecai, not bowing down to me, it means nothing. So this is how selfish and proud he was. And look what he does in verse 14. Zeresh, his wife, said, and his friend said to him, Let a gallows be made, fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak to the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon and go into the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman. He caused the gallows to be made. So here's a man who's prepared to hang somebody who doesn't respect him, who's, who is proud. Now we come to chapter 6. And this is the wonderful thing about this, this book. The tables turn because God and his providence, it's a wonderful part of scripture really, is that Mordecai, this man who refused to bow down to him, of course, was a humble person. And in fact, he'd saved the king's life many years back. So verse 1 of chapter 6. That night the king could not sleep and he commanded to bring the book of the records and of the chronicles to get the archives out. And they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of uh, Bigthana and Tiresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king, Ahasuerus. So in other words, Mordecai had found out two people wanted to plot to kill the king. And he'd stopped it. He saved the king's life. And what does the king say in verse 3? What honour and dignity has been done to Mordecai for this? And the king's servant said to him, there is nothing done for him. And here's a quiet, unassuming man who has saved the king's life and has not been rewarded for it. And the king wants to give him a reward. Verse 4, who is in the court? Now Haman was come to the outward court to speak to the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. We can just see this happening, can't we, in film. We can just see the scene set that Haman comes into the court. And the king's servants in verse 5 said to him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. The king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in. And the king said unto him, wanting to reward 
this person who had saved his life, what shall be done unto the man whom the king delights to honour? Now Haman thought in his heart, to whom would the king delight to do honour more than to myself? Now if that isn't somebody who is proud and who is deceitful, who knows that he, wants to, he deserves everything because of his position, I don't know what is. And Haman answers the king, verse 7, for the man whom the king delights to honour, then he reels off this whole list, doesn't he? And he's thinking, this is me. What would I like? Well, verse 8, the royal apparel. Bring the royal, the king's clothes, which the king used to wear. The horse that the king rides upon. The crown, which is set upon his head. Let this be delivered, verse 9, into the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man with all, whom the king delights to honour, and bring him on horseback through the streets of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honour. So here's Haman thinking, what would I like? I'd like, the, I'd like the, the royal clothes, I'd like the crown, I'd like the king's horse, I'd like to be paraded in front of everyone. Look at what happens to the person who the king delights in. And he's got it all worked out, hasn't he? This is, this is pride. This is, the, this is what he wants for himself. And then, yeah, absolute killer line this, isn't it? In verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, Make haste, take the apparel and the horse, as you have said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sits in the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that you have spoken. And it's just an incredible line, that isn't it, in our, in our scriptures, that the king says, All of these wonderful things that you desired, do them to somebody else. And of course, Haman can't handle this now can he and the, the the bottom line is in chapter 7 and verse 10 when Haman has been found out really what he's like and what his character is like so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai then was the king's wrath pacified so it just seemed to me a really good example of someone who was proud who had been promoted who thought he life owed him everything and he was brought crashing down, wasn't he? Um, by the king wanting to reward somebody who was humble, somebody who was unassuming. So those are our two examples, and we want to now go on, just finally, to the teaching of Jesus. So come over, please, to Matthew 23. And maybe we can think about our discipleship. as If we want to be followers of Jesus... We have to follow his teaching. And this, has, this chapter has the teaching of Jesus in it. Matthew 23, just a few verses from verse 9. And this is really interesting in the context of other religions. I mean, we think of um, other, other religions, and we'll talk about this in a minute. Verse 9, Jesus says, Call no man your father upon earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. You know, when we think of we think of the Catholics, they have um, El Pap, don't they? Papa, Father, the Holy Father, the Pope. You know, that's their leader. That's their figurehead. They call one on earth Father, Holy Father, don't they? And Jesus says, "Call no man your father on the earth, for you've got one Father in heaven." Um, so that's a quite a serious um, thing to to understand, isn't it? Jesus says. Um, your father is your father in heaven verse 10 neither be ye called masters for one is your master even Christ and then here's his teaching about what our attitude should be he that is greatest among you shall be your servant whosoever will exalt himself will be abased and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted so Jesus is saying if you want to be my disciples my followers uh, you should be Humble, you should be able to serve, you should be obedient. It's about subservience, it's not about pride and human um, pride. And we should be servants, not masters. That's quite challenging words, aren't they? Some of those. So let's come over then finally to Luke 12, please. And this is the parable that we read earlier of the rich fool. And I suppose in one sense it's really about complacency, this. Um, there is pride in there, isn't there? There's pride in the fact that we can look after ourselves, we're self-reliant. 
And we won't read it again, but this man, in verse 16, he'd had a good year, hadn't he? He'd had a good crops. He had plenty of um, food in it. He had more than enough to store up for many years to come. And he says in verse 17, what shall I do with all these fruits? I'm going to build bigger barns. I think it's a bit of an American barn, so I might have to, <laughs> might have to find a better image for that. But he said, I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to... Um, and there's nothing really wrong in that, is there? He was, he was thinking ahead for the future. But this is where, where he went wrong in verse 19. I will say to my soul, Soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And I suppose it's a complacency, it's a self-reliance. Um, he had lost perspective that every breath he took was provided by God. That there's a greater power in this world than ourselves and he he thought i'm going to just take it easy i've planted my life all sorted ahead of me um i will eat drink and be merry but verse 20 god said to him thou fool this night your soul will be required of you and what will happen then to those things which you have provided in other words he was going to die that night in his sleep and what good was all this planning and this um self-reliance going to do for him and I suppose he'd become a bit like Nebuchadnezzar or like Haman. He had learned to rely on himself and not to rely on God. And the lesson is verse 21. So, that, so is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So I'm going to finish now by bringing this round to us. And what relevance has this to me? Um, well, the Bible makes it very clear, as we've said, that God is in control. He rules in the kingdoms of men. It's not man in charge. And God desires humility, not pride. He wants us to be obedient, to serve. And there are examples throughout the whole of the scriptures for us to learn, to learn from. There's good examples and there's bad examples. And if we want to be followers of Jesus Christ, then we've got to be humble. We've got to serve. We've got to um, abase ourselves. We're not to be proud and arrogant. And just one final point I'd make is sometimes we might think in this life things are unfair. Things are unjust. There are proud people out there who seem to be prospering and seem to be um, booking the trend. It, this life seems unfair sometimes. Um, you know, I think of I think of some. You might think of somebody like a rap star. You know, there's so much arrogance and there's so much um, pride about those people. And you might think, well, that they, you know, they're having a, a great time. They're rich. They're living the lifestyle. But in the long run, friends, the kingdom of God, there won't be people like that in God's kingdom. God wants us to be humble, to serve each other, not to be proud. There will be justice and righteousness in the kingdom. So I'm going to leave you with a, a thought now um, to take with us. Be humble or you will stumble. Thank you.